Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us for our first uh, Rocket DevOps customer webinar of 2024. This is actually our third session today. If you happen to attend the other sessions, um, it, we will be presenting the same content. Uh, my name is Julie Homan, and I am a customer retention marketing manager here at Rocket Software. Let me run through a couple housekeeping items and then we'll, we'll get kicked off. Um, all att attendee lines are muted and we will be recording our session today and I'll be sending that out probably Friday out to everyone who registered. Um, we will utilize the audience Q and A um, feature within WebEx. If you see at the bottom right side of your screen, um, it's either a question mark or it might, um, you might have to click into this uh, little circle with the three dots to find it. But that's where you're gonna type in your Q and A. Um, we will, if there's some big questions that we wanna review at the end, we'll repeat those um, verbally and, and give you the answers. But Otherwise, you can type your questions in there and um, be sure that you're asking your question to all panelists so that we can all see it. Um, and lastly, we have a post event survey that's going to pop up when you exit the session. We would love your feedback. And that's actually how we um, decide, you know, the topics that we're going to present for the next webinar. So take a minute to do that if you don't mind. Let me introduce you to my team that's with us today. We have Chris White, Principal Product Manager for the DevOps product line. He'll cover what's new in Rocket DevOps 10.3.1. And then um, he's going to set up um, Andy Finley's uh, demo portion with some, some content before each demo. And then uh, Linda Chestenau and Dale Asher, our Level 3 Principal Tech Support Engineers, will cover some support topics at the end. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris White. Thanks, Julie. And um, thank you, everyone, for attending this afternoon. It's great to see so many people here. These webinars are becoming really successful with, with lots of attendees. Um, I, I wanted to start off just by refreshing your memories. Um, in 2022, we renamed our DevOps products. So there are, we, we have two core products, Lifecycle Manager for IBM I and Lifecycle Manager for Enterprise. Uh, LMI and LME, uh, respectively. We renamed LMI to RDOI, Rocket DevOps Core for IBM I, and we renamed LME Rocket DevOps Core for Enterprise. The last version of LMI was 8.6, and the current version of Rocket DevOps Core for IBM I is 10.3 PTF1. And the last version of LME was 6.7 and the most recent version of RDOE is 10.3. The products are the same products. So the options are the same, the, the software is the same. Um, there's obviously enhancements and fixes and new features that we've made since then, but the products are the same. So it, they're not new products, they're the same products as you've always enjoyed using. So LMI became RDOI and LME became RDOE back in 2022. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So this session is uh, about what's new in 10.3.1, which is the release we made in, um, in March, quarter one of this year in March. Uh, just to summarize the uh, the enhancements that we made and uh, and the new features we added and some of the things we're going to see today, uh, we, we can divide them into three areas, really. Uh, Rocket DevOps Test and Rocket DevOps Portal, uh, Rocket DevOps Core for IBM I and other things. So what we released for Rocket, so Rocket DevOps Test is currently part of Rocket DevOps Portal. It is a separately licensed, separately chargeable um, Set of features, but it's in it's in it's it's inside Rocket DevOps Portal. So when you install Rocket DevOps Portal, the, the installer will ask you if you want to install Rocket DevOps Test at the same time. So it's it's um it's accessed from a single user interface, and the options will appear if you install the Rocket DevOps Test as well as Rocket DevOps Portal. Rocket DevOps Portal is our orchestration module. We introduced it uh, two or three years ago. We're building lots of new features into Rocket DevOps Portal. We'll continue to build features into RDOI and RDOE. 
a lot of the access to those features will be controlled from Rocket DevOps Portal. So if you haven't done so already, I encourage you to install Rocket DevOps Portal. It's a, it's a, um, th there's no charge for Rocket DevOps Portal, uh, I, I, with the exception of the testing features. So the, the, the main features of Rocket DevOps Portal are uh, no, uh, no additional charge. In fact, one of the things that we added uh, to Rocket DevOps Portal was um, was our report manager um, module, which we which we originally charged for. But we we decided that we would no longer charge for Report Manager, and we'd add that to Rocket DevOps Portal. So now, when you install the portal, you get the Report Manager free, and you get access to a whole bunch of reports and dashboards, uh, compliance reporting. So let's talk a little bit about the things we've added to the this this latest release. Inside of Rocket DevOps Test, we added the four we we enhanced and added four capabilities. So test data extraction validation, test data update validation, visual screen compare, and consolidated logging. And we're going to step through those today. We're going to give you demos and examples of how you use those today. Test data extraction validation is the ability to um, extract data and then validate that that data meets the rules that you've decided for your app, uh, that, that your data should meet uh, and before you begin any testing. And we'll talk more in detail about that shortly. Test Data update validation is the way that we monitor test data during your testing. And then we tell you whether the data passed your validation rules when it was updated. We've added a visual a screen compare so that you can actually compare screens visually now rather than having to look at a log. Uh, and, our, our, and with all the products, we're, we're consolidating logging into Rocket DevOps Portal. So each, each product has its own set of logs. Uh, and typically to access those, our support team will ask you to log into the product or go to a folder or a directory or a um, somewhere in the IFS to, to, to retrieve logs. We're adding that capability to Rocket DevOps Portal and the, uh, and the UI the user interface, which is through a web browser, will will take you directly to the logs where you can extract the, the information that the support team needs to, uh, to help you with your support calls. So we're going to take a bit of a look at that today as well. Rocket DevOps Core for IBM I, we released the PTF, uh, this quarter PTF1. Uh, if you need to use any of these new features we're talking about with a, with a new version of Portal or Test, you need to install this PTF. It's, it's a small PTF, but it contains some critical features and connect, connectivity. And then this quarter, we released some VS Code improvements. We released, for example, we released a um, RPG to RPG free format conversion uh, tool. We added a Jira plugin for Jira Cloud, and we added SonarCube integration. So if you're if you're using SonarCube to scan code, uh, we introduce uh, int integration into Rocket DevOps Portal, so you can send your code off directly to SonarCube and have it scanned, and then look inside of Rocket DevOps Portal to see the results of that scan. We're going to cover the first uh, Rocket DevOps test portal uh, um, points there today, but, but we won't be covering the other points. We'll, we'll, they'll be covered in our next webinar, and Julie will tell you about that towards the end of today. Okay, if we can move forward, please. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is the data validation and and uh, and, and anonymization. So, so customers often tell us that they, that they they need to extract data from their production database to perform testing, and they've asked us for ways to do that in, in the past. Um, so we figured that the, the best place, the best source of test data is definitely production data, rather than having to create new data every time you want to run a test. And and testing requires clean data. So um, that's data without uh, without erroneous information in it, and also a subset of the data that you currently have. So production databases can be very large, and um, and often what's required is just a subset of that data, either just to reduce the size, or or because you want specific types of data in your test data. You, for example, you may want uh, a particular data from a particular country or customers with a balance of greater than 50,000 pounds or dollars or euros, 
or you might want some uh, customers with a particular type of particular type of industry that's recorded in the database. And of, of course, um, with the growing data governance uh, concerns, um, the data, data must we must be um, must must be anonymized. So um, it, it can't contain personally identifiable information for testing purposes. So Rocket DevOps test uh, gives you the ability to filter um, filter data that gets extracted. So we can extract data from production system on on one system. We can automatically copy that data uh, after filtering it to another system and anonymize it, anonymizing it at the same time. And the filters can be based upon uh, just about any field in the database that you want to field uh, that you want to filter data by. We can uh, help you anonymize it, so we pro provide anonymization features, which we're going to look at today, uh, to, to help you meet your any any compliance regulations that you have to apply. And um, all of this can be fully automated uh, during testing. So we're going to take a look at how to create a test, how to create the various activities that go into a uh, into a test, and how to automate all of those features. So the the the, the ability to extract data filter it and anonymize it can be fully automated. Okay. So I'm going to pass over to Andy Finney now, who's going to take you through a the, the first of today's uh, interactive presentations into the uh, extraction, validation, and anonymization of data. Andy. Thank you very much, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. So as Chris said, yeah, I'm going to take you through some um, recordings, sorry, and um, some presentations on our demo systems. So these are live presentations of the things that Chris is talking about in the slides. And the first thing that we're going to cover is the extraction of data and how to anonymize that data within the files. So the first thing we need to do is um, to define an extraction is coming to the testing um, area and to configure data extraction we need to create uh, something called a scenario. And we do that by coming into the test data option here and into the scenarios. And I'm going to click on and create a new um, data scenario. So you can give this any name relevant for you. So I'm going to call it some like credit check and then specify the system um, that this connects to. And then we're going to specify which libraries and files and what filters we want to apply to this extraction process. So I click on create and that creates my CD check um, data scenario for me. And then if we click on this, we can then start to add the libraries and the files that we want to extract. So if I say add library, it shows me all libraries on that system that I told the scenario to connect to and I can just search through and um, select a library that I'm interested in. Once the library is selected, I can then drill down and say that I want to add a table or a file from um, that library. So this will now bring up all the files and all the tables within that library and the flib. And I'm just going to select this one for now, but I could select them all if you wish and then click Add. So on this um, field here, if I click on the field, I could start to add filters. So as Chris said before, if I wanted to extract only certain data from this file, like all records relating to a particular customer or country or product, I could maybe put the um, field name in there and I could say that is going to be equal to a value and then that would only extract the um, the records that have that field name that are equal to that value but there's basically you can there's lots and lots of um, operators in here you can use to filter out that data so now basically what i've done is i've created a scenario i've selected um, a library and a table within that um, within that uh, library that I want to extract data from. So the next thing I need to do is be able to run this. And to do that, I create something called a test plan. And 
then I will tell it to use that scenario. So within the test plan section, I'm going to create a new test plan. Again, let's call it uh, CD, um, sorry, CD credit check. I create that. Inside my test plan, I'm going to add a new test suite. And then I could I could add more suites in here, or I could just come in and add a new test case. And I could put descriptions in here to say it's a um, data extraction or anything you like. Once we've got our test case created, we're then going to um, configure an action. And this is where I'm going to select the data extraction action. Again, I'm going to give this a name for credit check. I can give it a description. And in the details tab, I'm going to select the scenario, the data scenario that we just created called credit check. It knows the source connection because that's what I linked to that scenario. And then the target connection, I could either select a different system, which may be your test system that you'll be able to extract the data to, or in this case, I'm just going to use the same system. Um, the library that I've told it to extract from is Andy Lib, and I'm going to tell it to extract it to Andy F TST, the Andy F test. Uh, click on save, and then click the save button to save that action as part of my test plan. Now you'll see on my bring up a green screen if I just look for that library, Andy F TST doesn't currently exist. But if I just now come in and run my test plan, which I can then monitor in real time, shouldn't take too long to do. You can see that's 100% success rate, and you can drill down and look at the output. And it tells me that it connected to my source system, um, it located the, the library and the FLIB, the file. It had six records to copy in this one. Um, got the tables, copied all the all them into my new library and the TST, and then successfully completed. And if I look at my green screen, just repeat that command, we can see that that library is now there. So you can see it's, it's really quite easy to um, extract data, um, really easy process, um, how to analyze the results. Um, so, you know, quite a simple process. Now let's look at how to anonymize um, the data within the file there that I just extracted. So first, let me just show you using a standard query. So if I just do a work query and just create a new one, specify that file that I've just extracted into my library, my new library and the STST. If we look at this, just run the query. Um, I've got a description field here that has um, standard text for the description of these transactions. And if we look at that, that is in the description field, which is DRDL01 field. And we can see they are plain text. So what I'm going to do now is going to change my, um, my data scenario to say that I want to anonymize this um, this field so that when the testers look at them, they can't actually see what the, you know, the real text is. So I'm going to go back into my test data section and get into my scenario, select my library and my file, and then I see all of the fields. And there was the description field we were just looking at, DRDL01. And I'm going to add in obfuscation. We have a couple of different methods, um, so I'll show you the shuffle method first. What this will do, it, this is a, an example. If I typed hello and do a test, it will shuffle the letters round of the word hello. So let's just say save on that, come back to my test run, and I'll run this again. Again, it shouldn't take too long to run. You can see that's now completed. So if I'm now to look in, in query or whatever reporting tool you use to look at your file, and I'll just select that DRD LO1 field again. 
and you see that Rocky DevOps test has shuffled the letters around so that they're really you know, not readable from the, the plain text that it was before. So just to show you other methods of um, obfuscation, let me just come back into my test data. Again, select my scenario, my library and file. And if I edit that obfuscation, and this time we'll use the substitution methods. Now we, we provide by, by default as, as part of the product um, different dictionaries, but you can also upload your own dictionaries if, if you wish that can substitute values in files with data that you want to go in there. Uh, for now, I'll just say, let's use some world cities and then say, edit this. And again, I'll come back in and repeat the test run, rerun it again. Should complete. And again, I didn't show you the output on the last one, but if you just drill down, you get all the output again, the same that you were, you were seeing before, that it's extracted all the records in that file. And just one last look at the query. Um, I'll select that field again. And you can see that it's now um, used the dictionary of cities to replace the data in those fields. And just one other thing to mention on this is that if there are any other duplicate entries, if there are duplicate entries in these fields, um, then they will also be shuffled um, or, or substituted with different values. So Rocky DevOps test is, is intuitive enough to, to recognize this as a duplicate and replace it with a different value. So hopefully, you know, you can see that it's, it's, um, it's a fairly simple process to extract data, to manipulate that data, and then to be able to anonymize the fields within the files, which may contain sensitive information or to for governance reasons, but it's still providing the full structure of the files for testing purposes. So Chris, um, that's what I was going to show, you know, to cover that section. So back yeah, to you. Andy, actually, before before we drop from this demo, um, we had a customer ask, could you show the filter parameter again? The filter parameter again? Yeah, sure. If we go in back into the um, back into the into the file, and then the filter here, I've got no filters applied here, but you can edit this, and then you can start to type. So if I start a it's going to give, show me all of the filters that I could use beginning with A. So actions, add, after, allocate, alter, um, B, for example, anything before, between, begin. You can also use and or ors or joins or anything like this, um, equals to that kind of thing, else, if, equals. And then you just build out your filter that you would maybe want to match a particular field in that file, such as drdl01 equals, and then, uh, you know, a value that you would expect to find in that field or a country code, that kind of thing. You just build out your filter that you want to extract the data for. Is that okay, Julie? Yeah, that's good. Okay, excellent. So, Chris, um, I'll pass this back to you. Thanks, Andy. That was great. Okay, so let's take a look at the next section uh, for today. Um, we're going to take a look at the visual screen compare now. So, uh, so you tell us that green screen testing is, is still very important to you. Um, and, and we hear that from most customers. So most customers are still developing green screen applications, although we're, we're using lots of new technologies to create applications that run on or in conjunction with applications that run on IBM I. So we need a way to um, to test from green screen applications, um, as well as other testing. And we're going to take a look at the other types of testing, such as batch jobs or calling calling programs or or, or um, applications that live on other platforms. We'll be taking a look at that today as well. But green screen testing re re continues to be in, in important, uh, and uh, testing to be accurate. Uh, um, testing to be uh, tests need to be accurate. And you need to, uh, and verifying screen um, screenshots is is time consuming and actually rather difficult. 
Uh, and what we find a lot, of, a lot of customers are doing is they're cutting and pasting 5250 emulator screens into Word documents and then trying to compare them side by side. That's obviously not ideal, particularly if your test scenarios get more, more and more complicated. And that, that's another thing that, as I just mentioned, I, complexity of testing is becoming um, is become is, is, is increasing. Uh, and so um, we need a way to um, to help you uh, uh, record and play back green screens and then highlight where where there are differences and and in fact highlight where where you think it's important to highlight where there are differences and ignore those differences that you don't think are important. So we provide a terminal emulator with Rocket DevOps Test, and that runs on the IBM I. So the IBM I can now host its own screen emulator and record and playback uh, 5250 screen sessions uh, using Rocket DevOps Test. Um, the, the, the screen emulator captures uh, uh, the input and the output in, in each screen, and you can assign variables to, the, to that input and output, and we'll be taking a, a look at how that works today. Uh, and then you can convert that those variables if you want to uh, to to run the same script again with a with a different value substituted somewhere in the script. So we allow you to do that. And again, this can be fully automated. So you you saw Andy uh, uh, demonstrating test scenarios and test um, suites and test cases. Um, we, we can add a, a 5250 session playback into a test somewhere. So now it's possible to automate the extraction of data and then automatically run a screen session and capture the uh, the uh, any errors and highlight those after the uh, after the test is completed. Okay. Um, I think now we're moving back to Andy to demonstrate how the Visual Screen Compare works. Thanks, Chris. Andy. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, just before I moved into the um, the Screen Compare, I was just going to show the data validation, Chris. Was that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Okay, so. What we did before was we extracted data and anonymized it. Um, but one thing that we can also do in now is data validation. So this lets you validate data that are changed during a test case run, or you can validate all records in a database. It's, it's basically used to determine if the data is good or not. So. To do this, we configure something called a data validation rule. And again, we do that from within the test data section. And this time we not, don't choose scenarios, we choose validation rules. And we have something um, called a rule set, which just you give it a name and you tell it which system to connect to. So I already have a rule set here called data val1. Once we have that, we then need to define a rule um, that we are going to validate the data against. So when we say add rule, the first thing we want to do is we want to specify the name of a library. So I'm going to use the, um, the one that we just extracted in the, in the previous um, example. And then again, you'll see that once I select that library, it shows me all of the files that are available that I could validate data against. So I'm going to use the same file F005. And then it allows me to add some conditions. So if I just jump back into query again, and I just want to show you one of the fields that I will use for this. So if I just run this query over the whole file and scroll across, you can see that on this one, I've got a value here, QPA dev 004, and it's the workstation ID. So the field for this is DRJ OBN. So I'm going to produce some data validation based on that field. So coming back into my rule, I can um, say I want to add a condition, look at all the columns, and 
the one that I said was DRJ OBN. And I want to say that this must match, and the value of that was QPA dev 004. Click on save. And then that's my that's my data validation rule set created. So now we need again, we now need to be able to um, to run this. So what I've done, we do that again from the test plans. And I, I've already created a test plan called DataVal1 that has a scenario and a test case. And what I did in here in my actions was I added a new data validation. And if I click on this, you'll see all the details that I use to create this. So I used the validation rule set of DataVal1 that we've just created the rule for. That knows the files and the tables to validate. And in the success criteria, it shows me what this validation rule set is built on. So the library name and the FTST, the file name, the field name, and it should match this value. So if I just come in here now and I say I want to run this, um, this test plan, you can see it's just completed uh, that quickly. And if I drill down and look at the output, it's going to show us that that field, DRJ OBN, matches that value. So it passes it succeeded. And if we look at the outputs, it tells us how many records um, it, it went through, how many succeeded, how many failed. Now, if I go back in to my, um, my data validation rule and I change that, um, change that rule, Let's say I wanted to do our validation based on QPA dev 003. I just want to show you really how it looks if it fails. So we know that isn't the value in any of those fields. So if we just come back in now and run that test plan again, then we should get a failure as we have, as have here. And um, it's 100% run, but it's a 0% success rate. And again, if we drill down into the output, then we see that that field doesn't match that, so it passes at a failure. But in the output, it shows us um, what your data validation was set at, but actually what the value was. So I just want to show you, just before we move off this, just a couple of other things. There's some um, lots of different operators you can use for your, um, for your um, rules. So if I just edit this again, some of the others. So let's say um, we're going to look for that field, um, validate it that it should be an empty field. Click on save, run that again. And obviously we know that is not empty. So this test run should fail, which you can see it does. If you drill down into the output, it's going to say, I've checked those fields, it's populated, it's not empty. So it's classed it as a failure. And again, if we edited the rule and we use some of the other operators of which there are lots, you know, does not contain greater than, less than, and so on, I'll say he's not empty. And we run this again, then we should get a successful run. So just really wanted to show you that, you know, you, you can use data validation to um, uh, to check against your files for certain records in files and how to look at the output. So again, you know, it's quite easy um, to do that. Now, lastly, just before I hand this back to Chris, and then I'll, I'll you know, I will show you, or sorry, I will show you the um, screen compares. Um, all of the all of the runs that we've been doing have been I've been doing manually. I've been running them either from this test run again here, or I've been executing them manually by running the test plan. I could have run it at the, at the suite level, or I could just run the test case at that level. But I'm doing it manually here. If you want to introduce automation here, um, we can use the built-in um, functionality within the Rocket DevOps portal of using pipelines. And this is where we can start to automate the running of test plans and also define success criteria but the true um, CICD. So you can see here in this pipeline, I've got a pipeline here called DataVal. And if I just edit this, I just want to show you how this pipeline is, is put together. 
So it's running on this instance of RDOI. I've given it a, a, a name and it can either be triggered manually or you could you can trigger things from Jenkins. So we have a plugin with Jenkins and I could tell Jenkins to trigger this pipeline job. Um, in the release section, I tell it what group application and release it's set to. I can enter specific task information on the deploy option. I can, I can configure, tell it to do an RDO deployment or promotion, but also I can configure it to trigger an RDO T test. So when I click on this button, I get this box and that then gives me a drop down to, to where I can select all of the available test plans. I've selected data bar one and I've said, only consider this, this should stop if it's anything less than 99% successful. So it basically has to be 100% to be considered a successful run. So if I just execute this test plan now, I'll run it manually. As I said, we could execute this from Jenkins and then look at the history. We can see this running in real time. It's currently in progress. Should, shouldn't take too long to run. And what we'll get is to get the output from the RDOT test directly here within the pipeline job. And it's going to pick up on our data validation rule. And as the last one we had selected was to look for an not empty field, I would have expected that to be successful, which is which it is. And it classes that as 100 percent. Now, if I was to go back into my testing validation and I then changed my condition rule back to say that we were looking for an empty field, for DROBGN, and then again execute that from the pipeline job. Again, just really want to show you how you can see failures from pipeline jobs as well. You can see that here this one was successful. This is currently in progress, and once it's now looking for an empty field, which we know it's not in that file, so this should fail, and then you'll be able to see the output in the log. So it failed. It wasn't um, above 99%. So it classed that pipeline job run as a failure. So it's just a really, really good way of being able to automate the test plans rather than run, run them manually. Either You can either run them and trigger them from here, or you could trigger them from Jenkins jobs or even call them via an API. So that's some of the data validation that we mentioned earlier. Um, I'm now going to move on to look at um, the screen compare feature that Chris mentioned. So this was a new feature that provides visual screen comparisons of screen recordings. So I'm going to come back into the into RDOT and I'm going to create um, let's create something from from scratch. So. We'll call it um, screen comp or something like this. Um, we're going to compare a screen and we're going to compare some actual um, comparisons of the screens as well. So new test plan. Within my test plan, I'm going to create um, a new suite. And then in here, I'm going to have a new test case. And then in my test case, I'm going to add a new action. And in here, this one will be an IBMI screen recording. So I'll just give it the same name. You can give it a description. On the details tab, this is where we tell it which system we are going to connect to. And then I click on the record button. Now, as we do this, it brings up um, Rocket Terminal Emulator. And this is where now on the left hand side, I can do my things that I would normally do manually to test this on the green screen and on the right hand side you will see it will start to record my my keystrokes so first thing that i want to do is sign on put my password in i'm going to bring up that screen which when i press enter past i may want to add a library list a library to my list i'm going to go to a menu this time i'm going to take the statistics um, menu I want to retrieve data and let's say it's for this particular year. Once I've got my screen, that's my test. 
I want to then sign off. So pretty basic, but I could have, I could have included things like input parameters, output parameters, output lists. I can get it to loop around screens, those kind of things. But for now, I'll just take this as my recording, click on save. That then saves it as a JSON file and it attaches it to my, my screen recording. Now, what you also see as part of my, as part of this new feature is we have a new field in here called screenshots. And this now provides a list of all of those screens that we used and created uh, in my recording that I just went through then. So screen one was a sign on, then the message screen, then the command line, then I added um, a library list and, and so on. And what I can do with any of these is say that I want these to match, either be fully identical, or I want the inputs that I, I add to certain fields to be identical or the outputs. And so let's take one of these. Let's take this one, for example, and say I want this to be fully identical when it runs the test plan. And then click on save. And then I will then come in and I'm now going to run this test plan, which will extract the data and it should then compare my screens. So if I run this, we can either run this, I can give it a configuration name, by the way, and I can save it as its own configuration, which I can then run again. I can specify specific log levels that are set differently from the, um, from the test plan. I can also pass in additional parameters at this stage as well for ad hoc runs. For now, I'll just click on run. And go to test runs, we can monitor this running in real time again. It's now going to um, run through my screen recording. You can see that's successful. And if I just drill down into the output, what we get, it tells us that it was screen, the output parameters were all successful and the screenshot comparisons were successful. So you all, we always had the outputs where it encrypts the password, tells us that it identifies all the screens successfully. But now we have this option called screenshots, which show us um, that screen, when it was run, this was what it was expected. This was the actual. And then if I just come down to number seven and eight, then I specified, we specified that this should be identical. So this was what was expected. And this was the actual screen. So that's really just a, you know, a, a quick um, run through of how you can create screen recordings using the built-in emulator and then how you can specify individual screens and what what um how you should consider those successful whether they need to be identical or um matched on import or output values so chris back over to you thank you that's great thanks again andy okay so um, one of the things that we're asked um, frequently is how do we get started with RDOT? What, what's the, the process to go through? And there's, um, there's a good set of manuals and um, um, towards the end of this session today, we're going to, um, they was going to take you through accessing our online documentation. But the manuals don't really give you a kind of a roadmap of how to get started. So I thought we should uh, include that in this session today. So you can see how easy it is. One of the two of the things that we do when we're when we're writing any of our uh, Rocket DevOps modules are, and we, we we try to make the system as easy to use as we possibly can. We want people to use the software, and we want them to use. We want you to use it successfully. So we try to make it really easy to use. And then we, you you've seen we we always provide the highest degree of automation that we possibly can inside the product itself. And we've carried that through into Rocket, Rocket DevOps tests. So in the next session, Andy's going to show you how uh, we're going to talk about how to install Rocket DevOps test. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this session, um, Rocket DevOps test is included inside the Rocket DevOps portal installer. We didn't want a separate installer. We want to we want to make it uh, easy to install. So we've we put it inside the, the single installer. And then we're going to talk about databases, how to connect to databases, the URLs that you need to publish to users so that they can uh, access the system. And you mentioned dictionaries, so it might take a look at dictionaries. And CCSIDs, we have a lot of international customers and CCSIDs are important. 
and we have to take them into account during testing. And then we talked a lot about test plans and test suites and uh, and uh, and actions. So we're going to take a look at how we can configure test plans and test suites and what what they are. And then um, the things that we mentioned today. We've mentioned uh, screen recordings and um, automation and pipelines. But there's batch job monitoring and remote command. So we'll take a look at some of those things as well. Okay, um, let's have the next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to pass over to Andy, who's going to start, uh, who's going to give you a, a getting started introduction. Thanks again, Chris. Yeah, so getting started with um, with RDLT, as Chris mentioned, um, when you install the portal, you also have the option to install Rocket DevOps Test as part of that same installation. And once you run through the wizard to install it, you then have the testing tab and you will see the things that you see on, on my screen at the moment. Um, the first thing then that you need to do, um, the installation, by the way, that consists of the RDOT server programs and uh, these things called agents. And agents are the programs that run the test cases and agents have got various capabilities used to determine if they can run a test action or a case. And you can also have multiple agents that can connect to one RDOT server. So once you've installed that, the first thing that you would need to do after that is go into here, into the administration um, section and into um, test configuration area. And the first thing that you would need to do is look at um, the connections. So once this loads, give me a second. Um, in the connections, um, we first can get a configure the um, database connections using the port that you know that is specified during the installation. Within then we need to just set some things up. Um, there's not a lot to set up, but in the obfuscation, this is where we can add in. Like I said, we provide these ones as detail default. Um, these are the dictionaries that we provide. But you can also click on one of these. You can edit these. You can add more, upload a file which will add things to these dictionaries. Or you can just create your own dictionary if you've got, you know, um, things in a file that you want to replace data with when you do obfuscation, then you can use your own dictionaries in here. In the advanced section, if you choose to use the screen recording feature, then you'll be using the Rocket Terminal emulator and we need to specify an address for this with a port number. That's how it connects um, to that emulator. Here, upload IBMS screen recordings. You can either turn this on or off. So um, when you saw me do that screen recording earlier, it saved that as a JSON file. If you already have screen recordings saved as JSON files, then great, you could just upload those and upload them into an RDOT test case. If you want to do that, you simply just need to turn this on. And then lastly, as Chris mentioned, we have lots of international customers. So um, CCS ID may be important, which you can change you know, to your, your default um, um, character set within here. Lastly, I mentioned agents. Once the agents are installed, um, local agents are what are installed on this RDOT server, so my IBMI machine. They're local agents. This enables me to run test cases on this IBMI system. But we can also install agents on any Windows, Linux, or Unix systems. Um, so this is showing me that I've got an agent installed on this on this Windows box, and then I can execute test cases on that Windows system as well. So once we've got that configured in the test configuration, then it's really going back to doing things that you saw me do earlier. So you'd want to start coming into, into Rocket DevOps test here, start to add your test plans, your test case, your test suites, your test cases, and then start to add actions 
to determine your do your data extractions or monitor batch jobs or do IBMI screen recordings or do data validation and so on. And then once are all, those are all defined, you either choose to run them manually or you come into your pipelines and then you start to embed them in your pipelines to do true sort of full automation and true CI CD. So that's really how you get going with Rocket DevOps tests. You get it installed. We do some configuration in the administration section, and then it's just really straight into defining your test plans. So Chris, uh, I'll pass this back to you. Thanks Andy. So um, hopefully you can see how easy it is to get started with Rocket DevOps tests. Um, I mentioned earlier on that um, it's included in Rocket DevOps Portal, and um, and uh, and I encourage you to install Rocket DevOps Portal if you haven't done so already. Uh, I, I talked a little bit at the beginning about how we've added new features to Rocket DevOps Portal that we previously charged for that we we no longer charge for, uh, and there's a whole bunch of other new stuff that we're including in in the portal. And as we uh, as each new release of the software um, goes live, we add more and more functionality. To Rocket DevOps Portal, so it's really important that you uh, that you consider installing it so that you'll have access to some of the new features that are only available from within the portal. So I thought in this section we should take a look at uh, finding your way around the portal, and so um, Andy's going to show you how to uh, how to explore things like dashboards and the compliance and audit functions. Um, we you, you see we've added some reports scheduling and the, the ability to, to schedule deployments. Um, and we've already taken a, a little look at uh, pipelines and release management today, um, but we, we can show you how to find your way around that in a, in a little more detail. Uh, there's a deployment monitor in, in, the, um, in Rocket DevOps portal that allows you in, to interactively monitor deployments that are happening as they happen. And you can see things changing um, dynamically as things are deployed around the network. It's also the place where we've built uh, Git integration, and we've added some new verification features into this latest version of the portal. And then um, uh, there's, a, there's a section where you can uh, manage uh, administration, security, and licensing. So we'll take a brief look at some of those things today. So Andy, let me pass it back to you to, uh, to give us a tour. Thanks once again, Chris. So yeah, I'm going to start then by going through some of these uh, the tabs across in, in the in the portal. Um, firstly, on the home page, we have a couple of options. Um, we have the overview page, which shows your instances that you're connected to RDOI and E and whether they're active. And then you can also add favorites to your home page here. So these are just groups, applications, releases. I could either say just go in and just show me all of the objects that are in that release, um, or I can go show me the, the tasks that are active, or I can go directly to the dashboards, which I'll show you in a, in a second, and directly to a dashboard that will show me changes by release or deployment frequency, emergency checkouts. So it's just a, a nice front page that gives you simple act access to things that you work on on a regular basis. And these, these are customizable by user. So each user probably wants to see different types of information. A manager, for example, who's responsible for approving um, um, requests to promotions or requests to check out and so on, their pending requests, they would pop up on his, home page, his or her homepage here. The dashboard section, this shows you statistical information that's held within the RDOI and E databases. In, in a format across the top, shows you how many groups, applications, releases, tasks, and deployments, and so on that are in the system. And then different types of charts, which um, show you um, drill down into the information in a little more detail. Excuse me one second. And um, for example, this um, chart at the bottom, this shows us breaks down the whole um, application releases that we have defined and shows us how many objects are made up of RPGLE, how many are physical files, logical files, and so on. So it just gives you a good idea of some statistics of what your application is built up of. On the compliance tab, 
This is what's used for auditing, um, reporting, compliance reasons. We've got a number of canned reports in the system, the task information, release, activity, deployment and permissions and so on. And for example, I can create a new report on the fly here and select my group application release. Say I want this to produce for the last 30 days and just say generate that. That will now produce the report for me as HTML. Um, I can look at it this way, it shows me the detail, um, the objects, the, the exact the environment it went from and to, who worked on it, the version number, and I can then choose to export it as Word, PDF or Excel. Also in this section is the verification section. So when you run standard verification reports, which is a way of checking what is in the LMI RDOI database against what is actually in production. And if it finds any differences, then it will highlight those and then you can look at those reports. And then lastly, in this section is cybersecurity. And this is where you can look at the integration with Sonicube. And this is where we can look at the history of runs that are done with, that are scanned with Sonicube. So here we've got a group application release in RDOI, which is linked to Sony Cube, and we can look at the logs. These are the actual logs that are contained within Sony Cube, which are then brought back into the Rocket DevOps portal. The next one I'll go across to the top is the pipeline section, which we looked briefly at before when we were executing test plans and so on. And in here, you can create new test plans, test plans that will um, be linked to a Git pipeline. So if you're using uh, or using putting your IBM I source code into a Git repository, then that is integrated by the use of a pipeline. Or you can create a freestyle pipeline, which you can then use to trigger manually, or you can execute it externally automatically by Jenkins. Um, also in this section, in the release section, this is where you can drill down and look at your releases. So let's say Aldon, LMI, base. I can say that I want to view all of the objects. So this will show me, just like looking on a green screen, I can see all the programs and files. I can then filter that to search for a particular program or field. But in here, I can also use this for release management. So I can say I want to look at the tasks for this, and it will show me, uh, my system has just timed out, excuse me, sorry about that. Let me just log in again. But this is where we can use this section for um, true uh, release management. So you can give non-technical staff the ability to do um, technical functions, such as do promotions and deployments from one environment to the next. And as Julie mentioned before, I thought, we may have a slight glitch, but hopefully that is just a glitch and nothing too serious. I'll come back here into, into pipeline, into releases, or I could do this actually directly from my, um, my homepage. And you can see what I've, I've got here is, is my life cycle. So if I just take out, say, show me empty environments as well, I've got development, integration, then QA, then production. And I've got a task here at integration level. I could put a tick in this box and say that I want to promote this to the next environment. And that will do the promotion and the deployment if anything's attached to that promotion. If it's got deployment configured, we can monitor that deployment in real time. And we see all of the deployment sets in this window. We can drill down into a set and it will show us the send, receive and install reports. You just click on those and it's like looking at a spool file on the green screen, but it's displayed here nicely as in the in the um, portal. Shows you all the job information, the objects that have been deployed, the library it's gone to and the version number that was applied. You can either just choose to read or download from here. And the schedule option on the reports that I just shown you before, I could have chosen to add those to the scheduler. Um, I apologize, I, I, I missed to show you that. But once you do, you can say schedule to run it daily, weekly, hourly, monthly, quarterly. 
um, and then they when they you can come into the schedule section and then you can look at the history of all the runs and then you can look at the log of when the last time was run who did it and so on the integration tab this is where we've got our you can look at your integration that you configured with git so what i'm seeing here is that i've got 72 different releases defined within rdoi and two of them are currently being managed with a git repository so my insurance insurance payroll base here if i look um we can we can look it's it's linked to this url in um which is my git repository um when it was created and so on when it was last updated and we've also got this new feature in 1031 which allows us to do comparisons between and uh, the release in rdoi and the gitlab repository github bitbucket repository so you can see this one here is a match if we look at the results compared to the gitlab repository with rdoi and no code differences and this one i've done here my payroll insurance base shows me that i've got one file currently out of sync which once we've um it's my readme file so once i've done a resync to gitlab that would then be in sync rdot i will skip because we've spent some time in that um, earlier today the last one i want to cover is in the administration section this is where um, we we activate things we can configure external applications such as gitlab and sonicube this is our global configuration to specify um, refresh rates and timeout values and so on security credentials should it be using passwords or tokens total security this utilizes role-based security like the product rdoi so i can create roles for managers specialists admins and so on and then add those users into those roles and that specifies what they can do in the portal we've increased and improved the system diagnostics so we can go directly to logs so should you ever need to contact support you can download the logs these are standard logs that our support team often asks for so you can either view them or download them directly we've got job logs and testing logs for rdot as well and um, sql specific diagnostics and we've also increased and improved um the housekeeping functions which allow you to create your new housekeeping rules um to tidy up temporary files um do verify requests in here so you just start to um, let's say create a new temporary files report we specify the the criteria so we say next um, you want to do this for so many days um and, and just save that so it goes into the into the, in the housekeeping log test configuration we we touched on very quickly earlier so lastly i'll just configure to show you how you can come into this licensing section to configure your licenses so just like you normally do on your green screen you can come into the for rdoi licenses you can come in here and you can look at the licenses that you've got and um, when they're due to expire, the feature codes and so on, you can look at how many registered users you've got for RDOI named and concurrent type users and what locations your deployments are licensed for. So, Chris, are you going to um, just talk about the API? Do you want me to pass this back to you while you talk about that briefly? Yes, well, let, let's do that. Okay, great. So um, lots of the things you've seen today, um, specifically those things in RDOP and RDOT are driven by APIs. In fact, nearly everything you've seen is, uh, can be driven by, an a by APIs. And we, we started to publish details of those APIs to customers now so that you can start to take advantage of them and, and connect our solution to, to, your, to your own solutions. We provide connectivity with things like JIRA and Jenkins and our own community manager project for um, for workflow uh, purposes. But we find that um, a lot of customers are using their own workflow um, uh, applications 
and they need a way to be able to trigger things or create things inside of Rocket DevOps. So we've started to, to publish details of these uh, of these APIs, and and as as every release comes along, we will publish new uh, new APIs or we'll publish the details of the APIs in those releases. So I thought it's probably a, a, a nice idea to show you where where you can find those APIs today, so that you can start to uh, consider how you might take advantage of them. Andy, why don't you uh, why don't we go back to you and you can start to uh, you can you can give us a little tour of where the APIs can be accessed from. Thanks, Chris. So yeah, as it, as Chris mentioned, the last thing I'll be um, showing today on this, and it's it's really just a highlight as we get asked, you know, how do we access the IPA I, APIs? How do we you know where do we where do we get them from? Um, so I'll show you this in a second. But what they are, they're basically a a set of RESTful APIs that follow current widely used API standards. And with these, you can do things like fetch RDOI and RDOE data, and you can perform basic operations like creating a task, promoting a task, getting release information, and so on. Um, the use of this feature is fully documented, and it can be accessed uh, from here within the help icon in the top right-hand corner and then going to API documentation. And then they've got links to the relevant areas. So portal, RDOE, RDOI, and there's also um, one for test, which I'll show you as well. And um, so the first thing you'd want to do is perform authentication into the portal. So to do this, I will click on the Rocket RDOP API. And this brings up the API builder with sample fields that allow us to put in our relevant um, system details. So we first want to do authentication. So these are the different streams I can use. I would put in my URL to my um, RDOP server, my password, click on send, and that would generate the JSON and API for us. Once you've got that authentication then, um, we then want to really go in and extract the information that we want. So I, let's say it's with RDOI, we can come into the RDOI section, and this then gives us a list of all of the things that we can do or automatically create APIs for. So once we've authenticated with our token, um, we're on, and if we wanted, for example, to do a promotion of a task, I would select this on the left-hand side, it shows me all the tokens and strings that are going to be needed then to produce this API that is going to promote this promote the task. So we get all the, the header information, the request body information, and the return values. And again, we can enter a sample. So put in the URL of the portal, your strings as tokens and your JSON strings, click on send, and that will generate the API for us. And um, very quickly, one last one I will just show you is in um, for we can also do this for Rocket DevOps test. So if you wanted to trigger your own test plan um, using an API, so as I've shown you before, you could run it manually or you could do it from a pipeline. If I wanted to do it via an API, then I'd simply come to this section, execution API and I would do a post run and um, tests. And when you click on this one, this is looking for the, the name of a test plan. So back in the portal, when we do, uh, when we're in testing and we have a test plan, I just drill down into this one very quickly. And if I wanted to run this test plan, the number of this plan up here, you can see my, my field is test plan 25. So if I wanted to run that as an API, I would simply put um, plan name 25 in here and um, click on send with the URL and it would generate the um, API for me to run that test plan as an API. So that's just a very quick overview up here in the help section, come down to API documentation. That's where you can read how to authenticate, create your tokens, 
and then create the APIs to perform the actions within RDO. Um, and that brings me to the end of there. So I'll pass this back to you. Thanks very much. Okay, I think we're going over to Dale in the support corner now. Dale, are you there? Hey everyone, I am here. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, you should be seeing uh, my screen right now. I hope everybody can see that. So um, we just wanted to go ahead and go over uh, uh, a couple of um, things regarding support. Um, we want to make sure that you've got access to all the information that you need to uh, to get your jobs done, whether it's installation, product validation, or just questions about the product. Um, the the first and fastest um, way would be going through the the support portal. So the customer portal um, you, provides you access with your um, cases that you've created yourself to any cases created by your team within your organization and also the options to um, to create a new case so that just takes a, a few moments to go ahead and, and create a ticket with support uh, we can get back to you on that um, it's also possible from there to access knowledge base uh, articles so um, from the home page here as i mentioned you can get to your team cases create a case um, or get to the knowledge base here. And uh, for example, if I had questions about validating the product, um, I can take a look at just my DevOps stuff. That's where you're gonna find everything related to Aldon and the, and the new rebranded versions of the products. But if I wanted to find out uh, more about, um, say, validation, I've got a question with um, applying new keys to the product. Um, I can spell that right and probably find more information on it. So as far as validation error codes, we've got summaries in the in the database um, or the knowledge base rather regarding that. Um, applying um, keys, for example, for HA or DR systems that you might have, things like that. Um, and, and in addition to, to that, we've also got the, um, um, the, the doc site itself. So, um, our new doc site, um, I just went into the top end of it. Um, I was taking a look at DevOps here. Uh, if we actually take a look at the home page, it's easy to select just the DevOps stuff. So, that's where we just were. Go ahead and select that again. And then again, um, we've got the ability to search. Um, within our products for uh, for particular cases. I can also drill further into it if you're um, an LMI or an RDOI customer um, and you've got questions regarding the documentation, you could drill into the version that you're currently using um, and then further filter it um, using searches. Um, we've got some new um, AI capability on the site. Um, we've got a GPT client uh, that's installed in here. So uh, just by adding a question mark to your question, uh, it will actually perform um, more search activity within our documentation stack um, and actually provide a summary, a summary of, of topics that are related to it um, from all of the validation um, information that it found in the documentation for all of our products. So it's another way to go ahead and drill into this. And then lastly, um, I don't know how many of you are registered to the forum, um, but we've got our, our customer forum site. Uh, I know that we've got a few hundred, um, mostly RDI, uh, RDOI customers that are um, enrolled in it. You have access to see previous customer comments and questions, so you can surf the site for things like that. Um, it's also a place to post non-urgent questions um, that might be able to be fielded by other customers um, or some of us in support that, that monitor the site. Uh, but again, if you've got something that's urgent um, or detailed or you need to provide logging information or something like that for us, uh, we recommend going through the portal. Uh, I have provided a few slides uh, in the deck with examples of this, so you can pass this out along your team too, so folks in your organization that might not be on the call um, can go ahead and, and review some of this stuff, and that can help them get to, uh, to, uh, to help as well. All right. And that's what I had for you. Um, Julie, you want to go ahead and take us home?
Yeah, so thanks to everyone today. I'm sorry we're running a few minutes late, um, but final thoughts here. Um, we are planning another webinar in Q3. Um, we are going to be deep diving into Sonar Cube, RPG Converter, VS Code Enhancements, and Jira Cloud. Um, we haven't uh, quite figured out yet what we're covering for support corner, but um, in the post event survey that you're going to get when you leave the session, there's a few questions in there about what type of content um, and how often you want to see these webinars. So if you'll fill that out for us and um, we'll kind of figure out what common topics we're seeing and try to cover those as well. Um, I believe we've answered all the questions that have come in. Um, if you have anything else, go ahead and type it in. If we can't get to it right now, we'll reach back out to you. Um, but thanks so much to our speakers today. I'm glad that we did not experience any uh, snafus with our with technical snafus. But um, everyone have a good day, and uh, I hope to see you next time.